For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, looks like we are live tonight on Standing for Truth. I've got Brother George with me and this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, as you can see on the screen, it's not looking too good for Team Dodgeball. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. The five Ds of dodge, they've been dodging all over the place. So today, we are educating Guts at Gibbon on Radio Active Decay. So this one's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a little technical. Um, to be honest with you guys, we have so much information that George and I were discussing before we went live that we could probably make this into a 10-hour stream. So what we're going to do, we've got uh, George here for about 45 minutes to an hour. I've got some clips that I'll probably show when George gets out of here. So we'll keep this about an hour and a half, and we're going to do separate uh, parts, as well as the fact that we're going to be having Bob Enyard on. We're just confirming a date where we are going to go into detail on the HPT model as well as the so-called heat problem. We're also going to be having Dr. John McKay on, PhD geologist. Um, so th that's the thing is, is we're going to cover as much as we can here. But this in and of itself is probably going to turn into a series. Guys, this Wednesday, Dr. Jason Lyle is going to be with us discussing young biblical creation to the critics. You know, don't be shy uh, from showing up to our interviews with these uh, big Young Earth Creation PhDs. We welcome the objections and the questions, and uh, we're hoping that this is probably going to be another uh, interview to remember. Guys, definitely check out the stream from last night. The irrefutable Guts of Gibbon still doesn't understand genetic diversity. So these critics, they got egg on their face. You know, they're being exposed for straw manning and misrepresenting. So, George, thanks for being here, brother. Thanks for being here. Uh, no problems, SFT. Um, just keep in mind, I have to be somewhere else. Uh, so I, I might have to leave uh, early. Uh, but uh, knowing you, you can probably get it through uh, yourself. So should I should I start it off, uh, SFT? I think that's a good idea, brother. We are going to the, let's just get right into it. Leave no stone unturned, okay. and yeah, I think that's a good idea, George. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, a, a small disclaimer: the topic of radiometric dating and radioactive decay is not for someone with little background in geophysics or geochronology or nuclear physics, for that matter. Let me say from the outside outset, uh, we are not those. Uh, this is why we have organisations like CMI, AOG and ICR who have done a lot of research on the subject. Uh, we actually sought the advice of those experts um, and we also um, yeah, sought uh, specifically um, the advice of a geophysicist from CMI. More on that later though. However, before we address the various issues of the video, it's interesting to note that different dating methods result in different dates on the same rock. You will recall Erica stated that the, the different methods collaborate each other. That is the furthest thing from the truth. I'll give you, so, I'll give you some examples. Uh, for instance, some 20th century lava from the hopefully I don't butcher this, from Mount Nagaruhu in New Zealand, gave a rubidium strontium isochron of 133 million years. Keep in, keep in mind, they consider the isochron method as their most accurate, okay? They, uh, similarly, a samarium nodimium uh, isochron age of 197 million years and a lead lead uh, age of 3.9 billion years for the cooling time of modern lavas, that's a variance of nearly 3,000%. That's, that's not collaboration. 
Another interesting point is the age of the Crayon Canyon. Not even the uniformitarians can agree there here. Whether dating is found ranging anywhere from 6 million to 70 million. And, and, and uh, just as another example, the, the great unconformity is missing a billion years alone. <laughs> uh, most, most, I think most of the audience probably are aware of the uh, Richard Linsky skull, the uh, K&M ER 1470. Uh, su suggest su this is to just uh, uh, a bit of caution here, but during the 10 year controversy, yes, you heard that correctly 10 years, it turned out that the wide variety of dates had been obtained, but these were either not published or de emphasized. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, some ranges here. Uh, these included published dates of now, please listen to this, right? 0.5. 4.11, 6 7.48, 8.43, 17.5, and 212 to 230 million years. Okay, that's a four. Uh, that's a 46,000% variance. So I don't know how they collaborate that. I mean, that must be an embarrassment, the KBS, uh, for, for those that, don't know it's actually the kbs tough it's re it's known as the kbs tough but it relates to the skull that uh, richard limsky uh, actually found uh, okay um, uh, uh, in many cases the isotope ratios in the oldest crystals are measured numerous times but they simply take the extreme value of the right one the, that is the right one that they choose thereby rejecting as much as, listen to this, 80 to 90% of the other information was, which was present on the crystal. This is what we call discordant data. They never talk about discordant data. <clears throat> okay, just, just to touch a little bit on the heat problem, without telling you too much detail on this, because this will be addressed in greater detail by Bob Anyard, in a few weeks' time, as SFT uh, mentioned earlier. We should acknowledge why water is valuable to industries and in your car's radiator as a coolant. I'm not sure if people have heard but the, the term specific heat capacity. Well, the, the high heat capacity of water helps regulate the rate at which the air changes temperature, which is why the temperature change between uh, between seasons is gradual rather than sudden, especially near the oceans. Now, I can go through a number of um, uh, points uh, relating to the heat problem, but as I said, I think we'll keep that uh, as talking points for um, for Bob Bob Enyard. I think he will cover that in more detail. Now back back to the uh, radiometric dating issues. Okay. We all understand that there are three main assumptions involved with radiometric dating. Number one is the initial isotope amount are known. That, that's an assumption. They don't know that. The decay rate has remained constant at today's rate. Well, yes, if you look at today's rate, yes, but you're making an assumption that it's always been that. The, 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 third, the third assumption is the sample has remained in a closed system for millions and billions of years. As I'll show you later on, that's not the case. If we look at uh, some uh, radiometric dating, uh, apart from what you're asked to believe, all radiometric dating methods are subject to the assumptions mentioned uh, previously. These assumptions are, in, are unverifiable and unprovable. Contamination through leaching is known to occur and has been recognised and is even stated by the National Nuclear Security Commission. Now, this is what they have to say, okay? Quote, radioactive elements in soils, secondary deposits formed due to the leaching of uranium from minerals during chemical weathering. Uranium is mobile in groundwater but is readily precipitated by humic acids in soils. It may be found in carbonized plant or animal remains and may also fill openings in porous soils. End quote. That's a quote from the National Nuclear Security Commission. I have, I have other, other quotes from various scientists 
which say the same thing. Uh, uh, do you want to just uh, briefly introduce Scott Devlin, uh, SFT, so people know um, uh, where, where we're coming from and what his uh, qualifications are? Yes, brother, that'd be a pleasure. So you brought up some good points. And throughout the stream, guys, we're going to play Erica's video. I think we're going to be getting a solid 15 minutes or so from her video. We're going to pause it every minute roughly and kind of address each sentence spoken by her so we will address the heat problem in quite a, a good detail tonight but we're also going to be saving um, a, a more thorough refutation of it with bob enyart when when he decides to come on uh, when we decide to confirm confirm hopefully in the next week or two but uh, george real quick before i introduce um, scott devlin i like what you said because it's so true. They now look to isochron dating, okay, as supposedly the, the most irrefutable, most reliable dating method now, right? And yeah. I like how you pointed out that even isochron dating relies on at least one or more unknowable assumptions, right? And you mentioned uh, some of those assumptions about initial conditions, the constancy of rate, and, and a closed system, of course. But even isochron dating, and I typically point this out in debates, I pointed it out with conspiracy cats, and he just said, okay, you can have isochron dating. You know, he was no longer willing to defend it. Uh, they all require an assumed history. They assume away a special creation event. They assume assume away a global flood. So I just wanted to point that out, and I thought those were some well, good points. Well, you're, you're, you're very true. Even their own uh, secular geophysicists are, are now saying that then uh, isochrone dating is not reliable. So even even in their own um, secular society or community, uh, you're getting that same feeling. That's right, brother. So let's examine what a geophysicist has to say to Gutsit Gibbons' claim. So Scott Devlin has a, a Bachelor's of Science in Geophysics. That's right, uh, George? A, a yes, and, and, and he graduated in first class honors. Right, right. So during his university years, Scott was sponsored by Royal Dutch Shell to complete a degree in geophysics at the University of Leeds. He has since worked in the civil engineering, oil and gas, and medical device in, in industries. His interest is subsurface imaging has led him to publish research, apply for a patent, lead university field trips, and start a business with the help of a European government grant. Before joining CMI as a full-time scientist and speaker, Scott worked with neurosurgeons and neurologists to accurately image and navigate the human brain and spine. And his comments on the portions of the video uh, that Erica discussed radiometric dating and, and radioactive decay was he pointed out that Erica seems to have only skim read available information on radiometric dating and young natural clocks. A good thorough look at the CMI website would definitely be good further education for her and I would say the other critics um, wanting to know more about radiometric dating. It's important to understand how radioactive dating methods work, why they are not valid, why scientists who use them do not rely on them, and how they handle the results to get the outcome they need. And there's a number of um, recommended CMI articles on the on the topic. And I've also got some uh, references as well that I'll screen share as the video goes on. So this was all just a brief introduction, guys. Um, George, would you like yep. me to pull up her video now and we'll kind of go through it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think um, Scott's done a very good job of um, doing a timestamp on each one of the uh, Erica's remarks. So we'll go through each one of those um, and just um, let everybody know what what comments Scott Devlin has made regarding those. Perfect. Yeah. And I want to point out one thing that just came to mind. Go watch my third debate with Erica. She likes to say, oh, you have not addressed, you know, these issues on isochron dating or the so-called heat problem. When George leaves, I may even show you guys as proof, or you can just go look at it yourselves. In our closing statements, we had, you know, roughly five minutes uninterrupted time to address each other's points throughout the debate. And I spent my five minutes debunking her on the heat problem, isochron dating, so on and so forth. And she got to have the last word. 
and in her five minute response did not address anything that I had to say about the heat problem, anything that I had to say about the isochron uh, problem. So when these critics say, you know, we're not answering specific questions, what it is, is it's damage control. It's psychological. Um, so, you know, we don't buy it and we're really going to hammer it today too. So let's get right into it, George. I'm going to share screen here yep. and I'll make sure to share audio. I'm going to mute myself so there's no echo and we'll let it play for a bit. Maybe we'll let it play from, uh, let's say 19 minutes, roughly up to, we'll let it go for a minute and then we'll address each timestamp just so we're not constantly pausing and we give people the opportunity to get a good, uh, good listening here. So here we go, George. Good idea. good natural clock. The first of the criteria for a good natural clock is that it has to have a known initial condition. A natural clock must also have a process with a constant rate with which measurements of age can be made. The other two requirements for a natural clock are that the process of the clock must be irreversible and it must have a known final condition. So what is radiometric dating? How does it work? Does it fit the bill? Radiometric dating works like this. It is based on the law of radioactive decay, which recognizes that some atoms of a particular chemical element spontaneously change into atoms of a different particular chemical element. The parent element is reduced to a daughter element and an alpha particle. Only igneous rocks can be used as reliable natural clocks as they have a known initial condition, all parent and no daughter. This is simply a fact of geology. When igneous rocks form, they are indeed all parent material. We also know that the rate of decay is constant, meaning the second criteria for a natural clock. Well, how do we know that it's constant? Because we've literally thrown everything and the kitchen sink at the process to try and speed it up. We've tried high and low temperatures and pressures, irradiation with x-rays and gamma rays, bombardment with high energy particles, various levels of magnetic and electric fields, and incredibly high accelerations of gravity, conditions which would never be seen in nature on our planet. The best we could do was acceleration by 1.5%, and even that was on a geologically irrelevant element. All right, okay, George. You want to take... All right, I'll, I'll take the first, first one where she lists the criteria for a natural clock. Sure. Um, pl pl please note that um, only one of those can be known without any hysterical records, and that's number four have a known final condition. The first three, you cannot know those. That They'd have to be based on assumptions. So effectively, Scott says, radioactive dating does not meet her own criteria and does not qualify as a natural clock. Great points, great points, brother. Yeah. And I, you guys will notice that about 1940 to 1950, Okay, she points out, uh, you know, what what is radiometric decay? The parent element is reduced to a daughter element and an al alpha particle. But here's the thing. Um, she's really revealing herself as not being as up-to-date and knowledgeable on these topics as she presents herself as, right? Because radiometric decay does not just refer to alpha decay, as she has described, okay, guys? Decay products can be photons, positrons, large particle nuclei, small particle nuclei, single neutron, single proton, etc. Okay, the most common types are referred to as alpha, okay, alpha particle emission, beta, which is electron or positron emission, and gamma, Okay, gamma ray photon emission, uh, gamma radiation. And at um, timestamp 1950, George, what were your thoughts on that one? Oh, oh you will recall this one where she, she makes the statement only igneous rocks can be used for radiometric dating as they have a known initial condition. You will recall in our oil exploration video yes. where we showed – Oil is found in sedimentary rocks, yet she made the claim that it's the dating of those sedimentary rocks that helps geophysicists find the oil. That's, co that's a contradiction. On one hand, she says only igneous rocks can be used for radiometric dating. And then, then in the other sense, she, she mentions that the sedimentary rocks are dated to find the, the <laughs> date of the rock to find the oil. That's, that's silly. Right. Uh, effectively, effectively, uh, Scott says that this is not true. For all methods, the initial conditions are assumed, which is what we said earlier. 
How does she or anyone else know in an igneous rock initial condition? Only if they, if they or someone else were there, of course, to observe, measure the initial conditions, can we claim this with any authority? So, Erica, you've contradicted yourself. On one hand, we, we da only date igneous rocks, but on the other hand, you claim that uh, the, the oil which is found in sedimentary rocks is based around dating of those rocks. That's, that's a silly argument. Well, and here's the thing I want to point out, too. I mean, this is already really, really bad for her, okay? So the best way to test the validity of the, uh, that specific critical assumption, okay, it would be to take rocks of known age, and then we can, we can date them. Say we take rocks of known age that, that formed from recent eruptions, Okay, okay. As in, you know, for the audience sake, those that have occurred in relatively recent history. Now, here's what's funny. When they take samples, okay, when they collect samples from recent volcanic eruptions, and then they date them using, let's say, potassium, the, the, the potassium argon method, the dates obtained routinely are in conflict with the true age of those rocks. So here, here's what I want to point out to the audience. Here's a question you should be asking themselves. Okay. Uh, well, first, the whole assumption that you know, argon being being present in rocks of known young age. Um, the fact that we find argon in them, that whole assumption of zero argon in rocks of unknown age is unreliable. It's actually ridiculous. Why in the world would we then trust these dating methods if many of them can't even give accurate dates for rocks of known age, but yet people like Erica want us to trust these dating methods for rocks of unknown age. Makes no sense. Makes no yeah, sense. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, timestamp 1952. Okay. She says all parent and no daughter. This is simply, this is simply a fact of geology. When igneous rocks form, they're all parent material, but, as Scott points out, this is assumed for the potassium argon method, which is what I was just talking about. But it is demonstrably not true. Even looking at pumice, hope I didn't butcher that. Uh, no, George, that's correct. Pumice, yep. From recent eruptions, one can see that the rock forms with gas present. Thus, the assumption that there is no initial argon is a bad one, as I was just pointing out, okay? Um, since argon is present, to give you the context, argon is present in rocks of, of known young age. I don't know why she doesn't point this out. She just glosses over it. Isotopes, okay, Scott points out, are known to be inherited from the mantle. And many rocks used for radioactive dating are known to have open system behavior. Okay, for example, they exchange daughter isotopes with surroundings. Now, rising magma mixes with surrounding magma, and crustal exchange occurs. You can actually read secular isotope dating textbooks for this. Um, the suggestion, Scott points out for us, is that there is excess radiogenic argon at rock formation is supported by the drastically incorrect dates achieved in creationist radiometric calibration checks. Um, there's actually a paper an article I want you guys to read titled Argon Within Mineral Concentrates. And I'm going to screen share it, uh, George, if you don't mind. So yeah, go ahead. people yeah. can, can uh, see it for themselves. Okay. Um, right here. Excess argon within mineral concentrate concentrates from the new Dacite Lava Dome at M Mount St. Helens Volcano, Dr. Steve Austin. Okay, read through that. If you're the critics, read through it as well. Give your rebuttal. Give your refutations. There isn't going to be any. Um, Argon analyses of this lava dome at Mount St. Helens raise more questions than answers. Okay, the primary assumption upon which potassium to argon model age dating is, is ba based assumes zero argon in the mineral phases of a rock when it solidifies. This assumption has shown to be faulty. All of these assumptions, guys, that they rely on have been shown to be faulty. Okay, so um, yeah, re read through this one. This is one that we highly recommend. 
And uh, George, what are your thoughts, brother? Yeah, yeah the, the, the other point that Scott makes um, is uh, for other methods such as the samarium neodymium and the rubidium strontium and uranium lead methods, to name just a few, igneous rocks uh, do contain significant daughter isotopes because they are not gases and they cannot escape. So another assumption shot to pieces. Um, well, and yeah. I think there's a quote. There's a quote from from that paper too, and I'm definitely going to butcher some of the. Uh, oh, you want me to? You want me to do it? Yeah, yeah. yeah you're but, the expert here, George. Let's see. Oh, and then, I wouldn't and say, then say much, those I, words ten times fast. <laughs> Ortho- I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, <laughs> but um, yeah, the the quote from from the paper says, um, uh, "Phenocrysts or orthopyroxene, he, uh, homblend and." Uh, Plagioclase are interpreted to have uh, occluded argon. I think that should be included argon within their mineral structure deep in the magma chamber, and to have retained this argon after emplacement and solidification of the dacite. So that's that's really saying that you know the the assumptions that they're saying about um, zero argon when it comes out of the volcano. Is just plain wrong, and that's probably why why their um, their their uh, methods when when they do actually check those young rocks, they're getting ridiculous uh, ages. Right, and we've got somebody in the chat, some ignorant atheist as usual, with no actual rebuttals. Thomas Robertson says all that SFT shows are from creationist sources. Isn't it hilarious that this is evidence directly from the rocks themselves? How many times has Thomas worked on the rocks and done these experiments and looked at this kind of stuff himself? I mean, is it just in one ear and out the other? I have to, I have to show a picture on screen. George, what are your thoughts on that when they say that? Oh, this is all just creation sources. Well, well, those those rhodiometric dates that I mentioned earlier, they they're not um, something that creationists have invented. They they were actually done by uh, laboratories secular laboratories, scientific uh, laboratories, and, and that, that data is the data. It, it, we're, not, we're not fudging the numbers to, to show the variance. It's, it's just discordant information. Uh, you can't have uh, variances of 3,000% for the same rock using different methods. If, if they're correct, they should be at least oh, – let's, let's, let's be friendly. Let's say – if they're fifty percent within the um, within that zone, you might say, okay, they've got a case. But when you've got uh, variances of three thousand percent, forty six thousand percent, that's ridiculous. And isn't it funny how we had Dr. Steve Austin, okay, who's done a lot of this work firsthand. He has been ready to debate as long as it's a PhD for months now. No takers. All the geophysicists and geologists that I've asked are terrified to do so. And um, these evolutionists just need their their bottle back, their baby bottle back. Uh, and this oh, is yeah. how- I've, I've I've put out a a feel too on uh, Facebook and a few other. Social, social media about about that challenge and no one has really come forward well i mean here's the thing doki doki thanks so much for the uh super sticker thanks guys for the super chat super stickers uh we are laser focused tonight aren't we george so um this yes. is how people like erica dodgeball dan and thomas robertson in the chat this is how they read not only the creationist sources and citations but the non-creationist ones too so uh this is why they're making it all too too easy um for us sft uh sorry i missed that guy's name but if if he cares to have a look his own geophysicists disagree with the isochrone method Right. So it's it's not just creationists that are pointing this out. It's your own it's your own scientists as well. Okay. So so <laughs> yeah, time stamp the... twenty. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. You can take this one, brother George. Twenty o three. At twenty o three, she's uh, this is Erica states. We know the rate is constant. Scott says correction. <laughs> we know that when we measure radioisotope decay rates in the present at standard temperature and pressure, atoms are at rest in the ground state and in particular chemical structures, yes, it is a constant. And she then says, we have tried high and low temperatures. 
um, Scott says very low and moderately high temperatures do not affect decay rate, but very high temperatures do. Heating to plasma temperatures, that is 10,000 uh, uh, Kelvin, increases the radioactivity decay by many orders of magnitude. I've got some quotes further back where scientists have actually done experiments where they actually show accelerated right. accelerated decay. So for her to claim that we can't actually demonstrate accelerated uh, radioactive decay is just not true. It goes against what the science actually says. Does she have egg on her face again, George? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> That's a big egg. <laughs> It's a dinosaur egg. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, keep going, brother. That's great. Oh, okay, well, then, then she claims that the best we could do is an acceleration by 1.5%, and she's referring to beryllium-7 there. <clears throat> yeah, this, this, is what, this is what Scott says. This paper shows the decay rate of beryllium-7 varies when it is found in different chemical forms. This is because chemical bonding between different atoms involves the deformation of atomic electron wave functions. Therefore, decay by electron capture is affected by chemical bonds. Now, he goes on further to say, even the 1.5 may sound small, but if you equate that to a 24-hour clock, 1.5% different to your boss's clock could be 22 minutes late in a meeting or with him <laughs> or her. So, I mean, we'll, we'll, sh we'll, show you, we'll show you other, other examples later on where um, accelerated, accelerated decay is much, much higher than 1.5% were achieved. Uh, uh, the other chemical uh, forms uh, could further accelerate, uh, decelerate the electron capture and decay process. Some radioactive uh, isotopes can only decay by electron capture. Therefore, if you take away their electrons, you can slow down the decay rate to zero. It gives an um, example of rubidium-83. Now, I've got some examples uh, later on in this discussion yeah. where I can give you uh, some I'm of that gonna, information. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screen share a, uh, an article that I want people to save and read over and the critics can read over and, and rebut it. Um, I doubt they are going to, it's going to be possible where she says, as you touched on it, that we have tried high and low temperatures. Um, and you pointed out as Scott here, that very low and moderately high temperatures do not affect decay rate, but very high temperatures do heating to plasma temperatures increases radioactive decay by many orders of magnitude due to the stripping of electrons from the atom. So I want to screen share for everybody guys. Um, yeah, while while you do that, uh, SFT, I'll just I'll just mention this is a, a scientist. Uh, his name's H. C. Dudley. He noted five ways radioactive isotopes could change. He actually changed the decay rates of fourteen different radioisotopes by means of get a load of this: pressure, temperature, electric and magnetic fields, and stress. Right. Oh. Well, it just goes to show how out of date they are. I mean, this is like now. Now you guys can see why we dealt with our first ten or eleven or twelve videos on supposedly the hardest to debunk stuff: the genetics, Doctor Swami Das interview. This stuff is just cake. So here's the um, here's the article I want you guys to read: John Woodmarap, billion fold acceleration of radioactivity demonstrated in laboratory. Um, so go over that guys, this exciting demonstration that isotopic clocks can be accelerated at least a billion fold is good news to creationist scholars. It raises fundamental questions about the temporal stability of isotopic clocks. What else have we failed to consider in terms of the physics of radioactive decay? The myth of the virtual invincibility of radioactive decay to external forces has been decisively shattered. Shattered, guys. And the door to further research has now been swung wide open. Now, guys, we're going to get into the next phase. She's going to go over a few things that actually demonstrate, okay, directly from the rocks that radioactive decay, accelerated decay has occurred. And we're going to touch on a few of those lines of evidence, helium, fission tracks, and radio halos. So um, 
George, unless you got well, well, I'm just yeah, going to I'm just going to add. She she actually says that the decay rate to our knowledge is constant. <laughs> That's demonstrably incorrect. She even mentions herself that the rate varies at the at the timestamp 2027. So she's contradicting herself. Right, right. And right, well, she's, she is. It's just, I mean, she's really showing, as Scott points out, that she's read very little on this, probably just parroting arguments as usual. Um, yeah. Right now we're on timestamp 2034. Let me check the chat real quick. Good to see everybody, faithful, honest, and true. Um, so far, no arguments. So here's what Team Dodgeball does. They avoid the chat. They avoid the chat. Like last night, I had a few atheists in there. They're asking questions, giving some objections, and, and I'm sitting there addressing them. That's what we want, especially for our interviews, right? That's why when we had Dr. Carter on, we demolished all the evolution's best arguments. They weren't there for the McQueen interview because what they want to do is just hide out, not address anything, not provide any rebuttals in the live chat for us to debunk. No, they want to do damage control afterwards. So uh, Caleb Kismet, thank you so much for the super chat. You guys are awesome. So Godzilla Freak fighting back, Brother Bill. Awesome. Good to see everybody. Chat's going. Keep us updated on the audio, video. Make sure there's no issues. And George, it's up to you, brother. You're the boss here. You want me to go to the next? Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do, I'll, I'll do the uh, timestamp 21 where – because uh, I was involved in the oil exploration uh, video a few um, okay uh, about a week ago, but she she says the uh, fossil well, fuel well, well, industry. George, actually, let's well let's play it first so people can okay. hear what she's saying because we've only made it to twenty minutes and thirty seconds. So I'm going to let it play another uh, minute or two, and then we'll okay. go to the rest of the timestamp. So uh, guys, okay. we're laser focused tonight, and we're just we're hitting it hard. Okay, so here we go. And I'm about to mute myself so you guys can hear with no echo. We'll let it go for about another minute. We'll address it timestamp by timestamp. So this is the way to do it. So the rate is, to our knowledge, constant. This is something that was admitted by the very creationists who were trying to prove that it wasn't. The cake also has a known final condition, that being all daughter material. And the process is indeed irreversible. Radiometric dating is also corroborated by a dozen or so independent methods as well, and the fossil fuel industry relies on its accuracy for finding said fossil fuels to the tune of around $250 billion annually. So this seems pretty solid. What are the objections? First up, fission tracks. Fission tra tracks as physical structures are simply linear tracks in rock crystals usually around 6 to 10 meters long. Fission tracks are most often caused by the spontaneous fission of the parent uranium-238 atom into two daughter atoms of palladium-119. 238 uranium is well documented in radiometric dating records with its decay into 206 lead with a half-life of about 4.5 billion years. Fission track dating has a very good initial condition, being there are no fission tracks evident in newly formed rock. This is of course observed and confirmed today. Fission track dating also confirms the constancy requirement, as the spontaneous fission of 238 uranium atoms occurs at constant rate under natural conditions. The spontaneous fission of 238 uranium is irreversible as there is no known process in the universe that can fuse two palladium atoms together. The evidence of fission tracks, however, can be considered somewhat reversible as they easily disappear with heating. This is why fission tracks can only measure the last cooling of the rock, not its age of formation. Fission track dating has a known final condition. When all of the 238 uranium atoms undergo fission, the constant rate of the clock will cease, no new tracks will appear. The rate team, a crack team of creationist geologists attempting to disprove radiometric dating, decided to take a crack at it. So the rate team decided to take a bunch of zircons and other minerals from all across the western United States in order to test whether fission track dating fell in line with the rest of the radiometric dating methods. They basically concluded, in a paper authored by Andrew Snelling, that some of the results from the Middle Cambrian samples, quote, failed to agree with previously published results showing major disagreement or discordance, the young 2005. The research team then explained that the discordance was probably related to the thermal histories of the rock and differences in measurement technique described by Snelling in 2005. Furthermore, DeYoung discussed the regional history from the area where the samples were collected and asserted that some of the discordance could be attributed to the fact that tectonic movement in the Colorado Plateau long after the Middle Cambrian caused the rocks to be heated above their annealing temperature and the clocks were thus reset. The ICR team went on to state that almost all other results are concurrent with dates previously obtained for the rocks using other dating techniques. From this statement, ICR admits to believing that millions of years of decay seems to have occurred in these rocks assuming a constant rate of fission. ICR appears to have followed standard procedures and obtain typical results from the rock samples they collected, as one cannot find any serious flaw with their methodology or the results which they obtained. And yet, here is ICR in the year 2020 touting exactly the discordant dates and nothing else. ICR is gene-sinning here. Because here's the rub, right? The very authors cited by ICR in this paper propose reasonable natural methods for why they got a handful of discordant dates, and they further admit that the majority of the dates corroborate typical ancient Earth measurements. So what the hell, ICR? 
Fission track dating is also corroborated by like a dozen other radiometric dating methods. Oopsie. So the consensus on the entire affair of using it as a corroboratory method of dating rocks seems to be, by the admission of ICR's data as well as countless other analyses, that it works just fine. Next up, radio halos. Radio halos occur in certain types of igneous rocks, such as granite, that contain minerals like zircon and monazite, which can be inclusions within other minerals, such as mica. It is known that the crystal lattice of these minerals commonly contains traces of certain radioactive elements. These radioactive materials can leave radiation damage in the form of discoloration in the surrounding rock. This radiation damage, or halo, All right, George, let's uh, okay. let's go to town oh, oh. here. So we just got through another five minutes. I know you've only got about 10 minutes. So let's um, let's smash through these timestamps okay. and I'll let you well, start, brother. Go ahead. OK, at timestamp 21, where she refers to the uh, the fossil industry uh, spending two hundred fifty billion dollars uh, annually. Uh, we've covered this fairly well, I think, in the oil exploration video we did uh, four or five days ago. But, uh, Scott, this is another geophysicist that pretty much confirms what, what we said. Uh, he, he says, uh, this, this sounds very impressive, but it is not true. Exploration from fossil fuels primarily relies on boreholes and seismic data. Geoscientists use geological maps and rock layer relationships in their interpretation but this is purely based on the principle of superposition and not on the specific interpreted ages gained by radiometric dating. Geochemists may, may aid exploration by analyzing isotope signatures, but they do not need to assign ages to these isotopic signatures. While some geoscientists may occasionally use relative ages in their discussions, often assigning an age can add in an unnecessary extra layer of interpretation. Again, we'll, we'll say it again, R dating of the rocks has nothing to do with bloody oil exploration. How many times and how many people do they need to hear them say that? Well, uh, in their, well and you pointed out, George, in her last damage control community uh, post about basin modeling, yeah. Right. She debunked herself in the in the post itself because it it revealed the assumptions, the circular reasoning. Right. Oh yeah. Well, basic modeling is nothing but assumptions and interpretations. Right. That's all it is. Right. Um, yeah. No. Great. Great rebuttal there. That was timestamp twenty one. Um, we dealt with timestamp twenty forty on the um, the constant. Did you want to go into uh, so fish and tracks, she talked about at 2220, and she cites a couple of studies and gives quotes. Um, let me screen share, guys. I want you to, uh, George, as I'm screen sharing, did you want to read the section from the um, article that I'm about to screen share? Yeah, if you like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, a, speci a, a specific uh section that's got uh, underlined for us to read is um, with respect, this is qu quote, with respect to the fission track method, the closure temperatures depend upon the cooling rates assumed to be relatively slow and constant over millions of years. However, a fast cooling rate such as with a volcanic ash blasted into air or quickly deposited in water can have a much hotter closure temperature type crystals were cooled rapidly and stayed below the closure temperature while being buried, the results could be different. In a flood paradigm, the temperature of deep burial would be different from the present day geothermal gradient. I, I think I mentioned the geothermal gradient a couple of times with uh, my um, uh, discussion with uh, David McQueen. But it goes on to say, in the flood scenario, rapidly cooled fission tracks could stay below the closure temperature. On the other hand, if the ash was deposited in the basin with hot water, all the fission tracks could anneal at even shallower depths of burial. So the flood would significantly throw off the assumptions of fission track dating. And it is difficult to derive much information about flood burial and erosion from the two dating methods, end quote. Now, SFT, we discussed this uh, before we went on air. Uh, 
the, the, you, you mentioned the the um, with the heat problem or the uh, heat of the um, granites and what that would do to fissures and um, zircon crystals and, and radio halos, etc. You want to you want to repeat that because I think I think you did a very good job explaining it. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's um, that's a good point. Okay, so she talks about the rate team here. She talks about fish and tracks. Guys, the rate team did indeed discover a lot of evidence in the rock that much nuclear decay has occurred. So Erica oftentimes misrepresents them and doesn't represent them accurately in the fact that they talk extensively about all of these lines of evidence. I'm going to briefly go over it right now. So for example... With the fission tracks, okay, um, what it is, so you've got particles that are given off and these result in damage, okay? And the same thing goes for the radio halos, which she's about to get into. We're going to talk about that too. Now, um, nuclear decay has occurred and a lot of it. That's what we see in the rocks, okay? If there has been a lot of nuclear decay, um, with fission, for example, for example, fission is where the uranium atom splits, Okay, it's, it's what we get actually in a chain reaction that produces a nuclear explosion. What we have, guys, is two halves of the, of the atom flying apart. And because they're so large, they damage the crystal. This is damage directly observed in the rocks. So it damages the crystal, but as a result, we can actually then see these tracks or trails because of the damage to the crystals. As in, this is where the particles damage the crystals, okay? Each atom that decays then leaves one track, and we can count the tracks. Now, evolutionists will look uh, to these lines of evidence and make uniformitarian assumptions that are unprovable and, and unknowable. But guys, I want to point out, as, as uh, George wanted me to reiterate, I want to point out in regards to the heat problem, okay, this destroys the heat problem. Okay, we've destroyed it in the past, but I want to do uh, this is icing on the cake. So uh, the heat given off due to all of this accelerated nuclear decay, guys, it is quite interesting to note that with both the fission tracks and the radio halos, guys, experiments have actually been done to show. And Dr. Andrew Snelling points this out for those who want to research deeper into this, that if you heat a rock, the damage in the crystal repairs itself. And it literally obliterates the damage. It obliterates the radio halo. And it obliterates the track, as a matter of fact. So, for example, Dr. Snelling points to Los Alamos, okay? So, a location where they had a drill hole. And as you go down, you go through a granite. And the halos, they're quite evident. You can see them, okay? But the in situ temperature of the rock increases. This is fascinating stuff. It increases as you go down in depth. When you get to 150 degrees Celsius, guys, the radio halos literally fade away and disappear, okay? Because the little particles, much like bullets, okay? Think of it like bullets that have damaged the crystal. The heat has energized the crystal. And as a result, the particles, the crystalline structure has repaired itself. Why is this significant to the issue of heat? I'll tell you why. If there had been too much heat, like the critics say, Okay, Guts at Gibbon wants to constantly just parrot this argument. You know, there's been too much heat. There's been too much heat. Well, guess what? Then it would have obliterated. This heat would have obliterated all of these radio halos, all Correct. of these tracks. We, we would not have this evidence with the fishing tracks, the radio, the radio halo evidence. Okay, so we've got, guys, we've got radio halos which are evidence of rapid nuclear decay. We've got fission tracks, which are evidence of rapid nuclear decay. But if there was as much heat given off as Erica suggests, these halos would have been obliterated. George, what are your thoughts? I, I agree. You, you did very good there, uh, SFT. Uh, the, other th the other thing I want to add, uh, having spoken to uh, Brian, Brian Nichols, um, he's the guy that uh, works with Walt Brown, they're currently doing, uh, I think it's revision nine on their HPT uh, book, and he claims that the next the next edition that that will come out, they will actually address in with mathematics the heat problem. So they will address the hot water, the radioactivity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They will show you calculations, and they will address all those 
so-called heat problems through mathematics. Right, right. Mm. Um, there's 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 no problem with with heat, guys, and it's also it's it's based on a straw man. It's like they're making a god in their own image, okay? Because through God's foreknowledge, and through the judgment of the global flood, they are accusing him of not knowing or realizing that there's going to be some excess heat that needs to be taken care of. But the thing is, as we can see, the empirical evidence suggests that the heat that was created through all of this accelerated nuclear decay was clearly not as big of a problem as they want to say. And we can, we can resolve this scientifically, but it also doesn't stop God from using a miracle, stretching out the heavens. But I don't even think we have to go that far. But still, they're accusing God in his foreknowledge of not uh, foreknowing this supposed problem and, and how to deal with it. So it's just ridiculous. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, George. SFT, before, before I go, I, I just want to add the part about uh, the accelerated uh, radioactive decay. There, there have been experiments done by Fritz Bosch uh, as well as um, – now, what what Fritz, well before I before I actually uh, go into the next one, what Fritz 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 Bosch said was he did uh, experiments on uh, rhenium one eighty seven. Okay, it has a half life of forty two billion years. When you strip the electrons from rhenium one eighty seven, the half life is only thirty three years. That's right. that's a billion fold. Okay, so er when Erica said the, the, the radioactive decay is constant, baloney. There, there, are, there are many ways, and I mentioned those um, those uh, ways in previously where, I, where H. C. Dudley stated that he noted five ways radioactive isotopes could change, and he and the, these are how he, he actually put it: via pressure, temperature, electric and magnetic fields, and stress. So, yes, we can vary it. Uh, L.A. Rensatelli, uh, another scientist, has, quote, he says, as much as 80% of the potassium in a small sample of an iron meteorite can be removed by distilled water in four and a half hours. Now, think about this, guys. Where did we have all this water? Right. Maybe a global flood? <laughs> it's all, all right sft i'm gonna i'm gonna leave you sorry about that but uh i had a pre prior engagement i have to be on site in what about 50 minutes now so uh, uh good luck and um i'll watch the replay tonight when i get back awesome brother awesome thank you so much this is this has been fun complete demolition Coco Puffer says, yes, because these crystal structures are just a few micros wide and silicones and zircons form strong lattice structures from very strong covalent bonds. Oh, they will before, default before, to before, a very consistent orientation under heating. Coco Puffer knows his stuff, I tell you. Before I go, SFT, there's, there's the latest research. I think it was um, uh, last month or not even as long as that, but they've actually shown – the actual crystals that are in um, the granites that are supposedly formed over millions of years can actually form over several hours to weeks. Okay? So you don't need millions of years of slow um, generation for the crystals to grow. They, they've shown that these crystals can grow within hours to weeks. That's amazing. Actually, George, before you get out of here, yeah. Did you want to address real quick the 23, 43 to 40, uh, 24, 20, where she um, says that ICR seems to admit that millions of years of decay has occurred within these rocks? But uh, ICR, CMI, AIG, they do make it clear that when they refer to these secular dates, right, because that's what's being published, um, they always do their best to make it absolutely clear that they don't accept the millions of years. Cor cor yes, correct, uh, and that's that's a misrepresentation. They accuse us of misrepresenting, yet he he they are doing exactly that. <laughs> so Scott Scott actually says this is likely a reference to the rate group research, which made a good case for uh, periods of accelerated radioactive 
decay in, in uh, Earth history. And you rightly stated with the um, radio halos and the fissures, if there was a heat problem, then none of that evidence would have been um, there for us to find. Uh, he goes on to say that that does not mean that ICR, that is the Institute of Creation Research, which was part of the rate uh, group, agree with secular dates of millions of years old. I, I think that they, they target that um, argument against uh, Snelling because they state that while he was working with uh, AIG, he was actually a consultant and he actually stated millions of years uh, in some of his reports. So anyway, he goes on to say uh, that the real dates are only thousands of years old, but that lots of radioactive decay has occurred. I think she has managed to make this interpretation by reading only part of the papers <clears throat> she cites. Uh, we often refer to secular dates because that is what is published, but always try to make it clear that we do not accept the millions of years, which is exactly what you said uh, a few minutes ago. Amen, brother. Amen. So that was an hour of just nonstop... Uh, uh, destroying her argument. So, George, I know you got uh, obligations. So, I want to thank you, brother. Cheers, Cheers, guys. Cheers. I'll talk to you later. God bless. Okay, bye. Bye. God bless, brother. So, um, glad to see everybody in the chat. We got a lively chat. We still got 30 people. Doki Doki says, game over. Yes. Definitely game over, guys. Um, Doki Doki. At least three assumptions needed. Constant rate. Clock started at zero, and rock is a closed system. See, everybody in our chat's getting it. Everybody's getting it except for uh, the one token atheist, Thomas Robertson, just doesn't seem to get it. I want to point out something, guys, okay? Clearly by what we've demonstrated here, okay, all we're getting, just like with the genetics, the biology, is arguments that are parroted from other people who have already been debunked. Also a lack of ability to actually read the creationist literature on this. Um, but given all this evidence, guys, of uh, radioisotope decay being accelerated in the past due to, of course, the, gen the Genesis flood, all of these decay clocks, okay, they cannot be relied upon in the way that these uniformitarians want to do so. So when they date rocks of millions and billions of years old, and those are the, the secular dates that are published, and we say, hey, this rock is 500 million years old or whatever, that doesn't mean that that's actually how old they are. Because of all of these major lines of evidence that strongly indicate that these decay rates, okay, these rates of decay um, were greatly accelerated at some point in the past, up to millions of times faster as, as we've seen, Million, uh, millions of times faster than um, the currently measured rates. So that means it is entirely plausible that the rocks are only a few thousand years. Okay, so we've gone through a number of her timestamps. We've, we've demonstrated why the, um, the heat problem is not a problem or else we wouldn't have these lines of evidence like the radio halos and the and the fishing tracks. Um, so let's, let's play a little bit more of the video, and we're going to end it soon and, and finish the rest for part two, okay? But what, what I find fascinating about uh, Team Dodgeball's epic fail of a three-and-a-half-hour video, as we've demonstrated even with the Joshua Swamida section, the fact is, it took them so long to, to put out this video and to edit it, okay, that we've already debunked a lot of the, these claims in our previous videos, discussions, and interviews. And I'm going to show that. I'm going to prove that tonight with a section of our interview, must-watch interview with Dr. Sarfati, PhD chemist, who destroys these claims, destroys the counter rebuttals to the evidence that suggests carbon is found in diamonds, found in fossils, and even strata that the evolutionists themselves date to tens of millions of years old. Okay, so we're going to deal with that. And 
let's see. Taz says, any upcoming debates, SFT? Yes, brother. So I'm in the midst of confirming a couple, okay? And a couple new ones, actually, um, with myself. And also, uh, we've got Neff. He's going to be debating a nuclear engineer, Jordan, who's been here before. He's debated uh, Bill, Kent, myself, Ramat. Uh, Jordan, he runs a podcast called, I think, Reasons to Doubt. He's always gracious enough to give us his time for these important debates. So he's going to debate Neff on the age of the earth, December 4th. That's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, working on a few other debates to confirm. But a ton of interviews. Ton of ton of interviews. We're going to have uh, Enyard on, um, as well as Dr. John McKay. We're having McQueen back on. Um, we are also having Dr. Lyle, of course, Wednesday. So content for life, guys. Content for life. Bill says, Jordan is a programmer. He only has a degree in nuclear engineering. Okay. So degree in nuclear engineering. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Guys, whoever just got here, because we're looking at 34 people, definitely uh, start from the beginning when you get a chance, because George and I, we we went to town. We were focused, and we debunked in detail from her uh, timestamp 19 minutes all the way up to now 25 minutes where she gets into radio halo. So let's have her... Um, Let's watch a bit more of her video and then we'll um, I'll give my thoughts since George is gone. Just a second, guys. I am going to screen share audio as usual. We'll let it play for a few minutes. I'm going to mute myself so you won't hear myself for a couple minutes and we'll let it play. appears as a fuzzy spherical shaped discoloration in the mineral structure emanating from the location of the radioactive material. Creationists and young earth proponents use a specific type of pleochroic halo purported to be caused by the radioactive element polonium to make the claim that earth could not be billions of years old but must be much younger. It is important to note however that polonium halos do not give any specific age of the earth and young earth supporters are not attempting to use them as a dating method. Instead polonium halos are seen as a way to discount scientists claims that the earth has a geologic record which took billions of years to form. In short polonium halos are not natural clocks because they cannot be said to give a specific age but creationists infer certain things about these halos that they say is evidence of a young earth. So polonium forms from the alpha decay of radon, which is one of the decay products of uranium. Since radon is a gas, it can migrate through small cracks in the minerals, leading to the polonium halos. The fact that these halos are found only in association with uranium, which is of course the parent mineral for producing radon, supports this conclusion, as does the fact that such halos are commonly found along cracks. When microfractures are not seen, it always seems to be when the crystals were formed in magma, which doesn't tend to crack at all. Additionally, if polonium halos truly had a nearly instantaneous origin, as suggested by Snelling, then even more examples of other polonium halo types would be expected to occur. We should see halos from 215 polonium and 211 polonium, as well as from 216 polonium and 212 polonium, but these are not found. The reason is that the radon gas atoms in these two decay series, which are the precursors for other radioactive polonium isotopes, have half-lives in seconds, and their daughter polonium isotopes have half-lives in the seconds and microseconds, instead of around 3.5 minutes for 218 polonium and 140 days for 210 polonium in the 238 uranium decay series. However, Gentry only found the one kind of polonium halo sequence among the three possible kinds in biotitan fluoride, of supposed instantaneous origin. So basically they had an opportunity for a prediction here, but the prediction was not met. So it looks like this one is busted as well. Bummer. Now we can talk about helium in the crust. Some creationists claim there is too much helium in Earth's crust for Earth to be any more than 2 million years old. If Earth has existed for billions of years, there should be little helium left in the deeper rocks as a result of radioactive alpha decay. They claim that if God had created the Earth with the initial helium in the atmosphere, the maximum age would be even lower than 2 million years, or perhaps even as little as 6,000 years. The Rate Project, which is of course co-sponsored by the Institute for Creation Research, the Creation Research Society, and Answers in Genesis, claims that the amount of helium present in minerals at different depths of the Earth's crust is simply too high to support the day age or evolutionist theories of an old Earth. They sent rock samples to allow for helium diffusion tests and their results were that the rock samples have too little resistance to the diffusion of helium through the rocks for the age to be greater than at most 2 million years. The conclusion reached by the Rate Project as to the reason for the increased helium is that sometime in the past few thousand years there was a period of increased radioactivity. A fundamental problem with this hypothesis, however, is that the amount of energy released during the accelerated decay proposed by the Rate team would potentially be enough to evaporate the oceans and melt the Earth's crust. I wonder if Stanning has considered this when proposing this flaw in radioactive decay. Likely not, as we have yet to hear from him about the heat problem. Not only that, but subsurface pressure and temperature conditions affect how quickly the helium diffuses out of zircons. Humphreys et al. selected a rock core sample from the Fenton Hill site, which Los Alamos National Laboratory evaluated in the 1970s for geothermal energy production. The area is within a few kilometers of the Valles Caldera, which has gone through several periods of faulting and volcanism. The rocks of Fenton Hill core have been fractured, brecciated, and intruded by hydrothermal veins. Excess helium is present in the rocks of Valles Caldera. This helium may have contaminated the gneiss that Humphreys et al. studied. In short, the entire region has a very complex thermal history. Based off of the oil industry experience, it is essentially impossible to make accurate statements about the helium diffusion history of such a system. 
So why choose volatile rock formations known for giving bad data? This would be like choosing metamorphic rock and using dates from that to attempt to disprove radiometric dating, which requires an igneous rock. So it looks like helium doesn't really fit the bill either. So what about magnetism? This creationist argument is based on the theory that was proposed by Dr. Thomas <clears throat> All right, guys. So, I mean, th this is bad. I mean, she literally says that the heat problem has not been dealt with. I challenge everybody to go watch our third debate where she mentions the heat problem. I rebut it for a few minutes straight in our closing statements. And I said, you can have the last word. And she doesn't even attempt to refute my arguments against the heat problem. Then as usual, as these evolutionists do, they go on complete damage control mode and go back to the drawing board and try and discover more ways to say that, you know, the, the question hasn't been answered. The argument hasn't been answered. If you go watch that debate, you'll find that I pointed out the fact that a global flood would have a lot of water. Okay. Uh, God bless fighting back. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed. And yeah, to anybody who just got here, please, Please um, watch from the beginning because we went in pretty good detail. So I pointed out that the flood would consist of a lot of water, of course. Okay, so all of that water that was on the earth at the time of the flood would have obviously been used as a shield. It would have shield, shielded Noah and the animals from the ark. I pointed this out. She gave no response. Okay, so if you've got more than a mile, which definitely you're going to have in a global flood event, as the Genesis flood, if you've got more than a mile of water, okay, and I pointed out the fact that we actually use water in a nuclear reactor to protect and shield things, this is empirical, okay? Then obviously this would not only shield from radiation, but it would also take up much of the heat, okay? There's no issue. And I typically point out, and there hasn't been any response to this as well, okay, that we read in Genesis, that the breaking up of the fountains of the Great Deep occurred. That would have involved what? Supersonic steam jets would have taken up most of the heat up and into space. And the Bible says over and over again that God stretches out the heavens, which means in that moment he could have easily stretched out the heavens, removing all that heat and taking it up into space. But I also pointed out the fatal blow, okay, because she wanted to go back to the drawing board and said, nope. Nope, the temperatures, it's just too high. It would have boiled the oceans. It would have destroyed the cross, melted the cross, you know. And I pointed out earlier when George was here, okay, that um, with the radio halos, the fishing tracks, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, address what she said here about the um, fishing tracks, but Dr. Andrew Snelling, okay, he's pointed to experiments, and he pointed to a specific example in Los Alamos where he, they had a drill hole. Okay. And go back and listen as I explained that um, as you go down, okay, you go down through a granite and you can see these halos. But here's the thing. The more you go down, okay, the in situ temperature of the rock, it actually increases the further you go down. Okay, so once you reach a temperature of 150 degrees Celsius, those radio halos, guess what? They fade away, they disappear. Okay, the heat has actually energized the crystal. And what happens as a result of this is the particles, the crystalline structure has actually repaired itself. So if there was too much heat, like Erica keeps saying, and we haven't answered the question, even though I challenge you to go watch that third debate where she gave no rebuttal to my answer to the heat problem. Okay, this is just icing on the cake. If there's too much heat, like Erica says, then guess what? We wouldn't have all this evidence of fishing tracks, radio halos, because they all would have been obliterated. Okay, see how this makes sense? See how easy this is? Okay, but guess what? We've got radio halos. We've got fishing tracks, evidence of rapid nuclear decay. So there's there wasn't as much heat given off as Erica says. In a nutshell, for a quote, guys, make this easy, okay? 
uh, instead of me just explaining it, in the book, Rock Solid Answers, okay, edited by uh, Dr. Mike Ord, he points out on page 194, okay, um, the heat and radiation produced by the burst of grossly accelerated radioactive decay would be destructive. He points out that since radio halos and fission tracks are obliterated at relatively low temperatures, remember I was explaining this? If there had been a heat problem, okay, Erica keeps saying, there's a heat problem, there's a heat problem. Okay, let's keep reading. If there had been a heat problem due to accelerated radioactive and nuclear decay, then we should not find radio halos and fission tracks in the rocks today. And he points out perfectly, he says, sadly, many of the critics, as we've proven today, many of the critics who make some of these claims against young earth creationists and their research are not qualified to do geochronology research, as we've proven today with Erica. And they have not carefully read and comprehended all the appropriate technical details provided by the young earth creationist researchers in their reports and paper. That's why she had no rebuttal to my arguments against the so-called heat problem in our debate, because she hasn't actually looked up the literature, looked up the lectures on this to find out what the solutions are. She just keeps saying there is no solution. And it is hilarious. Hilarious. Guys, they're dodging, they're ducking, they're dipping, they're diving, they're dodging all over the place. It's bad. It's not looking good. And this is why. This is why they straw man and misrepresent, guys. So good to see so many people in the chat. Glad everybody's having fun. Let me know how the audio is. But this is how they read the papers. Okay? Why was it so easy for me to find, you know, this icing on the cake, which they're clearly unaware of? Now, we're going to really be um, hammering um, icing on top of icing on top of icing of on top of the cake. <laughs> We've got Enyard here. Um, so we're holding back. And even though our holding back is still just, you know, d destroying her uh, arguments here. So here's the thing, guys. Okay. Um, that was uh, radio halos. Okay. 2450 to 2720 that we just showed her video. Okay. And the evolutionists can't complain. I mean, we're showing, we're showing all our arguments here. We've done so when, when we said we're going to address every single word, every single sentence, we meant that <laughs> go check the playlist that we've got addressing every sentence. Okay. She's tapped out. So she says, we should see polonium halos, okay, within this timestamp of 2450 to 2720. We should see polonium halos from more examples of polonium types 215 and 211, as well as 216 and 212, but these are not found. Okay, she says. Um, she asks, she asks why Robert Gentry has not found these, quote, other polonium types. So I want to point out, guys, this whole section, <laughs> it's so bad. This whole section from 2450 to 2720 doesn't refute the finding of radio halos. Okay. What they found was that a large amount of radioactive decay has occurred in a short amount of time. Okay. None of that was refuted. It was dodged. But instead, she makes a... A, a very lousy uh, argument that avoids the fact when she says, why did Gentry not study polonium-215, polonium-211, etc.? Scott, geophysicist, points out that I suspect Gentry wanted to focus on the better data. Okay, Polonium-215 and polonium-211 are both from the reaction chain of uranium-235 Uranium-235 makes up only 0.72% of natural uranium. Whereas uranium-238 makes up 99%. So Gentry or anyone else looking for halos is much more likely to find polonium halos derived from the uranium-238 DK chain series. Scott says, I guess this is why Gentry did his study on the uranium-238 series. Although I would not be surprised if he has found polonium halos in the uranium-235 series. So wherever Erica got these arguments, just parroting, 
just parroting all of these, just like with the genetics. Um, Scott has pointed out that he has looked at a lot of halos. But guess what? When experimenting, a large sample size is better. Okay. Um, 2730 to 2957, she gets into helium. But uh, before I get there, I want to, I'm going to screen share a video of us with McQueen. And I'm going to say, Dr. La, when he's here on Wednesday, um, we welcome the critics. Bring your best arguments because um, PhD astrophysicist Lyle had a uh, informal debate, just, just a discussion for two hours with PhD in astronomy, Dr. Hugh Ross, where, I mean, it did not go good for Dr. Ross. He, he was really out outshined by Dr. Lyle, especially on the starlight issue. It, it, Dr. Lyle proved that Dr. Ross is not up to date on distant starlight and the one-way speed of light and um, the physics of it all. So we're excited. So the critics can ask any questions, bring up any objections that they like. So uh, I'm going to mute myself, guys. I want you to hear what McQueen has to say about the Radio Halos rate project, uh, wh what it all means, for example, um, and see why why they have to dodge so hard. Here we go. ...involved in the radio halo um, analysis with... Um, uh, oh, I forget the names of the scientists that were doing that, but uh, were, you, were you actually actively involved in that as, at all? Yeah, let me, let me turn my camera back on. Pick up the granite once again. I hope you're, everybody can see the mica, which is the sparkly mineral there. In this particular granite, that mica is called muscovite. But in other granites, it is black and it's called biotite. Biotite was the focus of the studies that Andrew Snelling and uh, Dr. Larry Vardaman and others worked on during the rate program around the year 2000. I was part of a team that was looking for radioactive halos. I'm sad to tell you that in the middle of my work, I fell ill and could not do as much as I'd hoped to do. But a part of my biography that I think your audience would find interesting is that in my University of Tennessee days, 1972, 1975, I worked for Dr. Bob Gentry uh, at Oak Ridge National Labs. And he taught me how to uh, prepare from specimens like this, the radioactive halos. And I have, uh, for the last 45 years, used Bob Gentry's research let me see the best way to describe this. Uh, if you understand radioactive decay, you know that there is a half-life. And the half-life of those isotopes is a very important uh, matter. If you have this golf ball I've used repeatedly, and you imagine that to be a zircon crystal, and then you go right into the middle of it, around that zircon crystal will be concentric ring rings of radiation damage. And those concentric rings of radiation damage contain one of the best arguments against the constancy of radioactive decay with time. Here's an example of one of those rings in mica. And that ring, that's an alpha particle. And that alpha particle, the amount of energy that produces that ring is related to, if you remember your physics from college, it's, remember, it's related to what's called lambda which is the radioactive decay rate. Gentry's work showed that if you begin with granites very low in the rock record, and you go up to other granites, and you look at these zircons and these rings, it turns out this, what is supposedly a constant, this lambda, is not constant at all. And so it's an evidence, very clear evidence, that the rate program showed. That because the diameter of those rings vary, Lambda varies, which means the radioactive decay rate has varied with time. And how can you use a radiometric clock where the clock doesn't tick at the same rate? You see the problem, George? Oh, I definitely I, do, but, but the uh, evolution is oh, not. Go ahead, George. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, just, just to let everybody know, the reason why you can't see SFT there is we found that um, David's audio improved when, when he left. So maybe, maybe we can um, have uh, SFT not get involved in these things uh, as often, and maybe all the audio will improve. That's a joke, SFT. <laughs> Yeah. Are you, well, are you picking me off the team I, there, George? Before I come before the group again, I want to figure out a way to hardwire my laptop into my internet so that 
I don't have to rely on Wi-Fi. So we'll try to make it better next time. Well, it's, yeah, it's we definitely really, really improved. The last, I would say, 45 minutes have been near perfect. And it was by putting myself out of the stream. It seemed like it's maybe saved some bandwidth. But with what you were saying there, David, I think is so fascinating. And so what you're saying is this is physical evidence within the rocks themselves that rapid nuclear decay has occurred. And according to our model, this was accelerated decay during the time of the Genesis flood. Yes, and please understand how everything is built. Uh, Bob Gentry was doing his work in the late 60s and early 70s. I then studied more about it in my ICR days in the 80s. And then we come all the way up to the year 2000 when rate begins. And that's when scientists like Larry Vardaman, John Baumgartner, and uh, Andrew Snelling began to think, well, maybe there was accelerated radioactive decay. And that can explain rapid plate tectonics. That can explain the enormous amount of heat that was put into the ocean. And then in the post-flood time, provide an explanation for what in my classes, I did not call the ice age, but I called it the ice moment to emphasize the fact that it was not hundreds of thousands of years. So you can really see why, and I'm glad to see the lively chat. You can really see why she has to dodge this evidence. And they'll often say that, well, you know, what can, what can speed up the decay rates? Erica asked me that in, um, our first debate, and she's the one that brought it up and then wanted to uh, move to another subject. Now, here's the thing. As McQueen here is saying, catastrophic plate tectonics, right? Meters per second plate movement, runaway subduction and subduction friction can wreak enough havoc in the rocks to accelerate nuclear decay in the rocks themselves. Also, heat and pressure and significant volcanic activity during the time of the flood, the fountains of the Great Deep breaking open, would help significantly to speed up um, to speed up the decay rate at the time of the flood. And then, um, then they want to bring up the heat problem, which we've dealt with extensively. Once again, I'm going to read it. Dr. Ord, guys points out the fact that since radio halos and fission tracks, which was a major flop by Erica here dealing with, since they're obliterated at relatively low temperatures, if there had been a heat problem due to accelerated radioactive and nuclear decay, then we should not find radio halos and fission tracks in the rocks today. But guess what? We do. We do. Coco Puffer says, do you have the paper I sent you on lead? And... Um, Lead found in zircons. Yes, brother, you you give me a lot of good sources, and I want to thank you for that. Um, so let's see. So uh, what else did did she say here? So um, the helium was the next part. I want to see what what section we're at on her. Great to see thirty five people in the chat. We're going on an hour and a half now, so we ended at thirty. Timestamp 30. So let's see. From 2730 to 2957, helium in the crust. Okay. Um, but it, it looks like she is claiming that the helium has come into the zircon crystals from outside of the zircons. In other words, guys, not from the uranium decay within them. Firstly, and we had um, geophysicist Scott give some feedback on this. And he points out that, and he's, a, you know, and, and he wasn't impressed at all with this. And we weren't either. And our arguments here were corroborated and improved upon uh, by somebody who, this is his field. <laughs> and he's looking at this like, you know, where is she getting these arguments from? And he points out helium is constantly escaping from rocks into the atmosphere. So it is not the natural direction for helium to go into rock minerals. Secondly, the minerals surrounding the zircons have far less helium and uranium than the zircons. Again, the natural direction is out of the zircon crystal, not into it. Repeating rescue devices isn't going to get Erica anywhere in this. Now, there's a paper, okay, um, that I'm going to, with a graph. It's, it's table one. It's going to say helium retentions in zircons. 
Okay, and I'm going to post this paper in the description box so you guys can actually see the graph. But you'll see it, okay, when you guys pull it up, you're going to see that the fifth column shows the ratio of the observed quantity of helium, okay? Q to the calculated quantity, Q0, and you're going to see the calculated quantity that the zircons would have accumulated and retained if there had been no diffusion. This is showing, okay? that 60% of the helium that would have resulted from radioactive decay is present in the zircons at 960 meters depth. This amount decreases with depth and temperature until at four kilometers depth, there is only about 0.1%. Okay. This is consistent with, okay, the helium diffusing out of the zircons. Helium diffusion rates increasing with temp. She also says, okay, Erica also says that the site choice was inappropriate because of a thermal history. The researchers assumed a constant temperature history, which is generous to uniformitarians. Notice how oftentimes we are so generous to them and it still doesn't work out for their model. Scott points out um, that this was being generous as it may have been hotter in the past, therefore even less helium. Guys, even less helium. Um, we discussed this uh, with Sarfati, actually. Um, so I am going to play that clip because it'll never be addressed. Guys, Team Dodgeball took so long to put out this video <laughs> that it turned out that we've already debunked it all because we predicted their arguments because their arguments are parroted and we've heard them all over and over again. Guys, I can't emphasize this enough. The five Ds of Team Dodgeball, dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. It's not looking good. They're constantly getting egg all over the face. It must be exhausting cleaning that off every single night. <laughs> so I'm going to play this clip from uh, Sarfati where we discuss these things. He destroys dating methods. And we discuss a number of lines of evidence in carbon dating. That is proof positive that these dating methods can't be used. And when they are used, they demonstrate our model. They're consistent with our model. Uh, and their argument about contamination, you know, with carbon being found in fossils and strata and coal and diamonds, you know, that are supposedly millions of billions of years old um, is, is dealt with here. And we've dealt with it over and over again. So, um, and these people, like in the chat, what was his name, Robert, saying that, you know, these are creationist sources. Guys, Dr. John Baumgartner, a geophysicist, he himself, okay, he investigated carbon-14 in a large number of samples. And guess what? Okay, these samples, when he investigated them, in every single case, the measured carbon-14 levels were in excess um, they exceeded the lab's background detection limit. And Dr. Baumgartner, he even found significant levels of C14 in coal, also in fossilized wood. And we discussed this with uh, Sarfati that they will never be able to address. It's bad for them. So here, I'm, I'm going to share screen, guys. And let's listen up. This is an important video, guys. So pay close attention. And appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth. Please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. What about the evidence from carbon, Dr. Sarfati, like uh, with diamonds, for example? Well, yeah. well see, yeah, this carbon dating is the best known type of radiometric dating. Sorry, but pardon me. The radiometric dating methods, you take a, an unstable parent uh, isotope, which decays over time into daughter isotopes, and supposedly from the amount of chemicals in the sample, you can tell how long that thing has been decaying for. Now, you have to have a certain assumption, like how much did we start with each of these things? Right. I mean, what, did we actually start with um, zero daughter atoms, or were they there in the first place? Um, has the rate been constant? Well, that's actually a reasonably good assumption. There are exceptions to that, which I think have been found now, uh, good evidence for that. But also, is the system 
a closed system or has it been contaminated with some of the stuff from coming from outside so you're destroying it i mean we, we always like to think of a bath a bathtub it, it's uh, got 20 gallons in it and the taps are on and it fills at two gallons per minute so how long did it take for the bath to, uh, to get to where it is and you might say, well, obviously it's 10 minutes, divide 20 by two. But in fact, what if I told you uh, that in fact, um, someone helpfully poured some boiling water in because it got a bit cold? So the source is some stuff from outside. And you didn't know the plug was leaking, so some stuff is leaking out of it too. And also the way I fill a bath, I might actually turn every, both taps on uh, full and then I actually slow down the tap rate so it doesn't overflow. You see, so you're assuming that the taps have been the rate, the rate that they're flowing now, but in fact, they've been changed over time. So you've got these certain assumptions that even apply to something as simple as a bathtub. Uh, and it applies to the radioactive dating itself. But then let's talk about carbon dating. See, carbon is one, carbon-14 is an unstable isotope of carbon. You know, carbon is, uh, you've got carbon in your body, it's the most important element for life, okay? Uh, so all of us have carbon. Uh, one in every trillion carbon atoms is carbon-12, which is unstable. And the theory is uh, something dies, it stops exchanging carbon with the environment. So the existing carbon is not replaced and it decays over time. And the half-life is about 5,730 years. And the half-life is the time taken for the stuff to get to half its initial amount. After two half lives, it's going down to a quarter. After three half lives, it's down to an eighth, and one sixteenth, and thirty second, etc. Okay. The point of doing the calculations, I'm, I'm not the chemist to do those calculations. You could calculate that even if the whole Earth was full of carbon fourteen, pure carbon fourteen, it wouldn't even last a million years. Okay. You wouldn't find any detectable carbon fourteen after a million years. So then you go to diamonds, and diamond is a type of carbon, uh, an allotrope, as we say in chemistry. So it's an allotrope of carbon is the hardest substance on Earth, apart from the human heart, anyway. As the point is, once the diamond crystal has been formed, it should be totally free from contamination. It should be about as contamination-free as you can get. So it's the perfect laboratory to test carbon-14 if it's a good dating method. And yet, they've tested diamond after diamond and find there's still carbon-14 in those diamonds. And yet, the diamonds are meant to be a billion years old or more. Awesome. Because they're over 100,000 years or over 50,000 years, we shouldn't expect to find any carbon-14 in the diamonds at all. So the fact that we're finding carbon-14 carbon in coal and diamonds shows they haven't existed long enough for the carbon-14 to have decayed. So this puts a strict upper limit on the possible age of these things. Not the actual age, but the, it couldn't be any higher than this. It might be lower, but it can't be higher. So carbon-14 is definitely a friend for the biblical creation model and a, and a terrible enemy for the billions of years dogma. Right, that's a really good point, Dr. Sarfati. And I find when you show them the evidence for like carbon and fossils, or even in strata that the evolutionists themselves will date to tens of millions of years old, they'll say mm -hmm. contamination. But then you bringing up diamonds, well, diamonds being the hardest substance on Earth, wouldn't its interior then be very resistant to contamination? I mean, well, can I they think the diamond is resistant, nothing is. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, that's further the method away. If, if it can't work on diamonds, it, it, I wouldn't trust it on, on, a, on a bone or, or, a, or a parchment, for instance, if it doesn't work on diamonds. Yeah. So, so um, you can both ways. Either you have to say that carbon 14 dating is reliable, or you can have billions of years. You can't have both. You can't right. do both. It, it sounds like they want to have both with, with a lot of um, the evidence and arguments. We've got um, Tony Torpa in the chat who says, What is a good explanation for how radiocarbon C14 originally got inside the diamonds where it was found in rate studies? I would have to assume it was primordial diamond, primordial carbon, because um, it couldn't have got in from outside. So, so presumably primordial carbon when I mean, the diamond was formed in the mantle. That's the only thing I can think of. That God created a whole range of isotopes, right. and there's a primordial amount in the initial in not diamond, because I'm not sure diamonds are regarded to have, who are, to have formed organic carbon. So uh, I just have to say it's primordial um, di carbon that was created there. The fact that well, however it got there is there. Right. The fact that it's there in the first place means it can't be that old. I, I think based on everything you're saying, the fact that, I mean, we find carbon in diamonds, fossils, I believe they've even found it in coal and fossilized wood yeah. mm -hmm. in, in places where they say are tens of millions of years old. So hundreds of million, billions, even, yeah. Billions of years. What about, I guess, because uh, Tony here mentioned the rate project, didn't they also find helium, which is incredibly slippery? They've discovered helium. Okay, this is Dr. Dr. John Baumgart was the one who did the carbon-14 work for, for rate, and he's got some really good material. He answers the objections really well. Dr. Russell Humphreys did another part of the rate um, project, which was to look at helium in zircons. And zircon is a very hard mineral uh, that's quite quite hard to melt. Okay, so here's where uh, we get into the helium in the zircon crystals. But I want you guys to pay close attention to uh, what he was saying about the contamination with diamonds being the hardest substance on this planet. What does that mean? Well. It's an, and I like how Dr. Sarfati pointed out, other than the heart, right? And that's what we see with a lot of these evolutionists is their hearts have been hardened. They won't open up their hearts to the truth. And the truth can be seen everywhere in the science and confirmed. It confirmed the, the Bible's account of origins. The Bible is the history book of the universe. So, um, and we see that it's consistent with all things science. So here's the thing. Because diamonds are the hardest substance on earth, that means it should be the most resistant to contamination. 
Okay, guys, this is basic. So this means the carbon-14, all of the carbon-14 found in diamonds, it's been there since the beginning. Okay? So I like I liked how he pointed that out to just demolish the whole contamination argument. So we're getting into the zircon crystals now, helium. Here we go, guys. And what he found was helium and zircon. Now, the zircon has radio uranium in it. Uranium is turning into lead. And in the process of uranium turning into lead, it loses eight helium uh, helium atoms from its nucleus. It's called alpha decay. Alpha particles are helium nucleus. So it emits an alpha particle. The alpha particle grabs some electrons and becomes helium. So you've got a lot of, of the fact that you have helium there shows that quite a lot of decay has happened. But in fact, if it had happened gradually over millions of years, the helium should have leaked out of the zircon because you can measure how fast helium leaks out. And there's still a lot of helium there. I mean, think about how long if you have a helium balloon for your kid's birthday party, you know very well that it's going to uh, shrink in a few days because the helium is so slippery, it's, it goes through the rubber of the balloon. You've had that frustration, I bet. Right. <laughs> so even, even zircon is, is not so hard enough to stop the helium from, from leaking out of it, and that can be measured. And so what Dr. Humphrey says, that this is, shows that we've had um, millions of years of decay, but it must have happened in an accelerated manner. So, so it's producing this decay really quickly, uh, such that the helium hasn't had a chance to escape. So all the decays happened very recently, and so the helium from that decay is still not yet leaked out. And he also did a control experiment with argon, which is like a, it's the same sort of gas, the same sort of inert gas as helium, but much um, heavier, so it diffuses more slowly. But he did a control on, on argon diffusion, again, it, it backed up what he found with the helium. So uh, helium is showing that the decay must have happened only about 6,000 years ago, otherwise the helium would have gone. Which again points to the fact that the decay rate has not been constant. And it undermines right. another major assumption <laughs> behind radioactive dating is the constancy of decay rate, and clearly Dr. Humphrey has shown that it's not constant. So I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. So that's evidence directly in the rocks then, Dr. Sarfati, that rapid nuclear decay has occurred, right. which gets rid of that assumption, the constant decay. I think it's, um, it's quite common in science to discover that something has occurred without being able to explain the mechanisms of how that has occurred. I and mean, Newton discovered that the law of gravity exists. He didn't uh, offer any um, explanation as to how gravity, why gravity works in the first place. He said, I formed no hypothesis. He wasn't going to speculate on what causes gravity, only that gravity exists. And um, for instance, I'm not sure how nuclear decay rate gets accelerated, only the fact that it has clearly been accelerated. Right. That's a really good point you make, because I've even read uh, in, in the rate research, uh, not only helium, but I, I believe it was Dr. Andrew Snelling who's pointed out the existence of fission tracks and radio radio halos. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's pointed out that there has been a lot of decay, but clearly it's happened in a way uh, that's been accelerated. And another thing he's pointed out, for instance, you've got some different rocks. Um, I mean, the same rock has been dated with different da uh, radioactive dating methods, and they give different dates. Right. But this is consistent if you have some episode of accelerated decay that accelerates the, the long lived isotopes more than the short lived isotopes and the alpha more than the beta. Uh, so it seems like there's a pattern there, which needs to fit whatever's causing the accelerated day, uh, decay is working in a pattern that seems to be consistent throughout everything that's been measured. It's hard to believe that isochron dating makes up for that, though, and that, that's irrefutable. Is well, isochron right? dating is supposed to take uh, the, the, into account the um, the initial composition, uh, initial isotopic composition. But Dr. Snelling, years ago, 20 plus years ago, and also Dr. Taz Walker in his honors geology project, he could actually find isochron plots with non radioactive isotopes. So it means that the isochron uh, lines they're finding is not caused, they're not caused by radioactive decay over time because he could do it with non-radioactive isotopes. Ah, that's awesome. So it means there's some sort of chemical fractionation process that's going on there, which maybe have nothing to do with radioactive decay because he's getting it in non-radioactive um, isotopes. And since you guys like Lord of the Rings, there's a Lord of the Rings connection I can make here too. Yeah. Now you, you know what Mount Doom is, right? Of course, yeah. Well, you know, the real live mountain in New Zealand is called Ngoro Hoi. It's a mountain in the middle of the North Island. It's a real live mountain. Yeah. I've seen it personally many times, okay? Um, you see, what they did is they dated, they got some lava flows they know they knew happened in the 50s. They know the date of the lava flow. And so 50 years later, they did radioactive dating method tests on this lava flow of known age, and they were getting dates of millions and even billions of years, even though they know the lava, um, how, the rock was formed only 50 years before. I find that to be so funny because why in, why in the world then, Dr. Sarfati, would we trust these dating methods if many of them, as you're pointing out here, can't even give accurate dates for rocks of unknown age? But then apparently we're supposed to trust these dating methods for rocks of unknown age. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So the real science will say, well, let's see if we can test this on something we know and see if it works. And clearly it does not work. So therefore, to use it for something we don't know, I'd rather trust the eyewitness account of the Bible than these dating methods that, right. that fail in, in places where we can test them. Amen. Amen. Great point. So I find it amazing that based on everything we're talking about here in this portion of the interview, if radioisotope decay was accelerated, as indicated by, say, the helium, the fission tracks, the radio halos, the findings of the rate team, and this occurred, say, during the Genesis flood, uh, Dr. Sarfati, mm -hmm. then realistically, these radioisotope decay clocks could never actually be relied upon when they do, say, date, quote unquote, rocks as, say, millions and billions of years. That's a problem. I think they couldn't be. Right. I I've, I've
So many good points there. So as you can see, 20 years ago, this whole isochron dating has been dealt with by professional geologists. And if accelerated nuclear decay has occurred, these dates that come back as millions to billions of years old, they can't be relied upon. And this is why Erica has had to dodge um, and not really address anything. So we've been going for a couple hours, guys. Anybody who just got here, if you want to see the bulk of it, we've dealt with her major arguments on this uh, over the course of the first hour or so of this video. So uh, her next portion that she goes over, we'll deal with it. She goes over magnetic fields and uh, she fails miserably to address the cold slabs. So you know what? Let's just, let's leave no stone unturned, guys. Let's deal with that part as well. So I'm going to screen share the rest of her portion on this. We'll go right up to about 33 to 34 minutes. So that means for those who just got here, we started the video at 19 minutes and we'll end it at about 33 to 34 minutes. So you're looking at about 15 minutes of just addressing every word, every sentence Erica has spoken here on radioactive decay, radiometric dating. So, and it's not looking good, not looking good at all. So I am going to share audio and mute myself again. So there's no echo guys. Let's allow Erica to bury herself. We can just let her speak and not even respond. And she just shows how circular her thinking is, how assumption-based and low-quality science, low-confident science her arguments are. Here we go. Barnes in 1971, and then again by Humphreys in 1993. Using data obtained by McDonald and Gunst in 1967, Dr. Barnes asserted that Earth's magnetic field has been decaying in a non-cyclic manner at an exponential rate since the beginning of creation. Barnes used the data of McDonald and Gunst to plot an exponential curve and, by extrapolating the observed data backwards in time using his exponential decay equation, Barnes claimed that the magnetic field was approximately 40% stronger in 1000 AD than it is today. Continuing this extrapolation, Barnes stated that the Earth must not be older than 10,000 years or else the strength of the magnetic field would have been so large that it would have melted the Earth. Unfortunately for Dr. Barnes, observed scientific evidence has shown that the Earth's magnetic field has not been decaying constantly since the dawn of creation. In fact, the magnetic field has fluctuated and reversed in polarity over time, proven by evidence of periods of increasing and decreasing field energy. Due to this cyclic fluctuation, scientists have argued that the strength of the magnetic field cannot be used to determine the age of the Earth since it is, in fact, a reversible and cyclic process. However, creationists have attempted to offer a solution to this problem. Dr. Russell Humphreys, a nuclear physicist, looks to the Genesis Flood as the cause of the fluctuations in the magnetic field. Utilizing a creationist theory that the Genesis Flood was caused by the plunging of tectonic plates towards the Earth's core, Dr. Humphreys claims that the tectonic plates would have caused a sudden cooling in the outer parts of the Earth's core. This sudden cooling, he says, would have caused the convection currents to flow within the core, which would generate numerous reversals of the magnetic field over the course of thousands of years. These field reversals would have happened rapidly at the time of the flood, according to Humphreys, leading to an increase in the intensity, strength, and direction of the magnetic field until it reached the maximum at the time of Jesus Christ. The scientific community has been quick to respond to the age data presented by creationists, and they have provided several counters to the claims made by Barnes. Any flaws found in Barnes' work also discredits the work of Humphreys, since Humphreys' work is based upon that of Barnes. The first made by scientists is that Barnes used an outdated model in his analysis of the Earth's interior. By using an outdated model, any assumptions made by Barnes become instantly invalid. Second, by using McDonald's and Gunst's data, Barnes only analyzed the dipole component of the magnetic field, which is not an accurate measurement of the overall strength of the magnetic field. Third, scientists show that the data used by Barnes more easily fits a linear curve than an exponential one, and Barnes shows the exponential curve based on incorrect assumptions. The scientific answer for the apparent decay of the magnetic field was given by Dr. Walter Alasser, a physicist at the University of Utah. According to Alasser, Earth's magnetic field is generated by a dynamo within the Earth's core. This dynamo used to be heavily understudied, leading to creationist criticism. But time keeps on slipping, 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 and we find out that the dynamo theory is, in fact, robust. Magnetism ain't gonna cut it. At long last, we reach cold material, which is Baumgartner's theory, and it still doesn't work without miracles, as Baumgartner himself admits. The thermal diffusivity of the Earth would have to increase 10,000-fold just to get the subduction rates that he proposes, and something would have to cause the advance and retreat of the magma bubble. Miracles would also have been necessary to cool the new ocean floor and raise sedimentary mountains in months rather than the millions of years it would ordinarily take. Baumgartner himself estimated a release of 10 to the 28th joules from the subduction processes alone. This is more than enough to boil off all of the oceans. In addition, Baumgartner postulated that the mantle was much hotter before the flood, and the heat would have to go somewhere. So these objections to radiometric dating are pitiful and outdated, which has me wondering, why is Sanding using them? Why can his channel not just admit that they have a problem? In the case of Homo habilis and Australopithecus D Well, that's it, guys. As you can see, not very Im impressive at all. Her arguments keep on slipping, slipping, slipping. So it's not looking good at all. Team dodgeballs dodging, ducking, dipping, diving, dodging all over the place. So let's deal with this. 
Um, we've dealt with the heat problem extensively throughout, so please go rewatch if you want to see uh, those answers. Let's address, so 2958 timestamp. She talks about magnetic fields. Okay, at uh, timestamp 3050, the Earth's magnetic field has not been decaying since the dawn of creation. In fact, the Earth's magnetic field has reversed in polarity over time. Now, here's the thing. Scientists have determined that you cannot use the strength of the magnetic field to measure the age of the field because it is a reversible and cyclic process. Note, guys, and uh, Scott... He points out that since we have been measuring the Earth's magnetic field intensity at the surface since 1829, we have measured a continual decrease of the field intensity, totaling 7%. During this time, the total electrical energy in the field has decreased by about 14%. Um, I want to make sure that my audio... Okay, so uh, let's see how the chat's doing. Okay, lively chat tonight. I'm, I'm digging. This is awesome. So glad to see that we've maintained a good audience the entire night. I know some of this can be be technical. So Scott notes on Erica's comments here at timestamp 3050, whilst the strength of the magnetic field at the surface has fluctuated and reversed, there is no indication that the energy has. Without a significant external source, this would defy the law of the conservation of energy. Therefore, the field's current energy can be used to determine a maximum age of the Earth of about, guess what? 30,000 years. <laughs> the evolutionist's best answer to this conundrum is to suggest that the Earth magnetic field is generated by a self-sustaining dynamo. Guts a gibbon. Okay. What Erica said was the dynamo theory is robust. Um, Xavier, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, so she says the dynamo theory is robust, yet we are still trying to formulate. And Scott points this out. We're trying to formulate a working, realistic, self-sustaining dynamo model, and no lab experiment has ever exhibited real dynamo behavior. See how they always overplay, overstate their position and their arguments, just like with abiogenesis. Then we get them into the ring. For example, go watch the video, Guts at Gibbon Takes the Abiogenesis Challenge. Doesn't address any of the chicken and egg problems. Maybe Dan Dan, the pseudoscience man, wants to attempt the abiogenesis next time. The abiogenesis challenge next time. Ain't going to happen. So then her critique of Barnes' work, okay? Um, apparently he used, uh, so out, he used outdated model of the Earth's interior. But here's the thing. And, and Scott has been so gracious with pointing out the major flaws of Guts and Gibbons' arguments here. Um, points out that it's not clear how this affects his work or claims. The problem of a quickly decaying field is still there for the evolutionists. They never want to address the problems. You guys notice that? That is clear with our genetics-related rebuttals. To this day, none of, a, none of it, all of the arguments, they've been ignored. Ignored. Now, here's the thing. Barnes only analyzed the dipole component of the magnetic field, which is not representative of the overall strength of the magnetic field. Over 90% of the magnetic field is dipolar. Non-dipolar contribution do not affect the observation that the magnetic, the magnetic field is rapidly decreasing. Barnes data more easily fits a linear decay than an exponential decay. A linear fit is possible because a 100-year snapshot is small compared with the Earth's history. But an exponential curve is the most natural choice because an electrical circuit experiencing a resistive loss or a mechanical system experiencing internal friction exhibits exponential decay. We are measuring between the two vertical lines at the right-hand end of the curve. 3309. She mentions the, the cold slabs. She displays a slide that says, Young Earth Creation View. 
And guys, uh, what I'm doing is I'm giving the timestamp. So if you guys, people who want to rewatch this, pause it. You can also go right to the timestamp and kind of compare. So uh, her slide says, cold slabs indicate rapid subduction. So Earth is young. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. She does not refute this. Apart from writing on another slide, cold slabs not actually problematic. I would like to see her attempt. This is coming from Scott, who's got a degree in, in geophysics. He says, I would like to see her attempt a more complete rebuttal. As Godzilla Freak says in the chat, repeating the same statement multiple times doesn't make it true. That's what they love to do. Repeat, repeat, repeat. So good point, brother. Good point. How do cold tectonic slabs stay cold in the mantle for millions of years? Once again, Erica. And here's the thing. They look to their um, savior who fails. Their savior, Corporal Anun or whatever his name is, he debated Naf. And it appears he's retired from debating apparently because he doesn't want to debate that topic anymore. And he actually... I'm 95% certain in that debate, he pointed out that he never heard of this argument before, but yet he was bragging that he's heard of all the young earth creation geologist arguments. And yet he didn't even hear about this testable prediction that was confirmed by Baumgartner. It's bad. It's really bad. And this is who they look to for their responses. And it's why they're failing so badly, so desperately. We have Dr. Steve Austin ready and willing to debate any PhD geologist, geophysicist. If they think they're so right and we're so wrong, why haven't any of them taken the challenge? Because they know they can't defend their uniformitarian pro, uh, model and belief system. Because all the evidence suggests what? Suggests... A global flood has occurred in the past. So once again, I'm going to ask the question, how do cold tectonic slabs stay cold in the mantle for millions of years? Okay. Here's how significant it is, guys. Okay. Since the evolutionists keep failing miserably, go watch the debate between RJ Downard and Neff. RJ Downard couldn't explain it. Plus, they never uh, point out that I loved the Tony Reid debate too. Um they, they can't deal with it. So let me break this down, guys. When we actually look at the continents today, okay, they are moving only very little, okay, very slow movements. You can even say snail-paced movements of the continents. But when we look to Noah's flood, we are proposing – continental drift not like we see today we are looking to continental sprint meters per second plate movements okay now the catastrophic plate tectonics model actually predicts based on this that the pre-flood ocean crust would then be dragged it would be dragged down into the mantle in a process that we call subduction. Nephil and Free and I had a two verse two debate about a year ago between um, emotionally stunted and Snake was right on modern day debate on the global flood. And Snake was right, kept saying, you guys don't make testable predictions. <laughs> I talked about this prediction and explained why it's so significant and we got no rebuttal and they never answered the question as to how do cold tectonic slabs stay cold in the mantle for millions of years. So go check out that debate, it was good. So here's the thing. The pre-flood ocean crust, it's dragged down into the mantle. This is a process we call subduction, okay? Now, guys, because that happened recently, according to our model, just about 4,500 years ago, the cold ocean crust should still be cold. This is obvious. Now, it has descended in the, into the deep, hot mantle, but because it only occurred, this has only occurred 4,500 years ago, it should be cold. This was a prediction, a testable prediction. Doki Doki, thanks so much for the super sticker. <laughs> Loving the unicorn. Um, great to see after a couple hours, we still got 30 people here. So this is an important video, guys. That'll be dodged as usual. Okay. Guess what? And I pointed, go watch my debate over a year ago with Godless Engineer. What a fail for him. He, he, I had to re-explain this prediction to Godless Engineer like four times. Four times. Okay. 
So mo modern seismologists, guys, they have discovered that there are indeed these huge cold slabs of rock that are located down near the core itself in areas that should have warmed up. If, of course, uniformitarianism and deep time evolution were true, if millions of years worth of time had passed, okay, then those slabs should have warmed up. Why are they so cold? Why is there such a difference in temperature? What would have brought those slabs down then instead of Noah's flood? Answer that question. The fact that we have cold slabs of rock that were predicted is actually confirmation of, of flood geology and not old age geology, okay? And when it comes to the, the rapid magnetic reversals too, here's another prediction. This prediction also confirming the C CPT model is rapid magnetic reversals. Okay, so now we know, guys, that the Earth's magnetic field draws our compass needle towards the north. Okay, but sometimes in Earth's history, it draws it towards the south. Now, old age geologists, okay, they believe that this has been happening for hundreds of millions of years and would have taken thousands of years to occur. It was actually old age geologists that found confirming evidence of rapid magnetic reversals. These are required for Noah's flood, guys. This was predicted. What they were doing was they were taking a look at lava flows that would only take a couple of weeks, okay? That would only take a couple of weeks in order to form. They took measurements of the skin of the lava to see the magnetic orientation. Now, what they were expecting to see was different than what they, they found because they were expecting to see almost no change as they went deeper into the hot lava where guess what? The interior should shift only slightly. Instead, what they found, guys, was the outside skin pointed north and the inside pointed south. So now we have confirming evidence from lava flows that the switch of magnetic field has to happen rapidly which is exactly what flood geologists expected. More confirmation of flood geology. So none of this addressed. Lousy rebuttal. Sad, sad, sad. Guts and Kibben's arguments are slipping, slipping, slipping. It's not looking good. It's not looking good. So uh, doki doki, thank you so much for the super stickers. Um, so for anybody who just got here, uh, we just hit the two hour mark. Let me see. So we've got, we started at 19 minutes. We just ended with, um, we finished off this whole section and 33.09 and went through to about 34 minutes. So definitely uh, Xavier says interesting. Here's the thing. Um, Dessel Dre says no want to answer. Is that about the population bottleneck one? We'll save that for another one, uh, my good man, because I want to keep this kind of on topic. Um, so, yeah, good to see the chat still rocking. So, guys, I wanted to keep this hard-hitting, laser-focused, and we dealt with every sentence, every timestamp necessary, every one of her arguments, and we just landed on the two-hour mark. So I think we're going to... Even though we still got a lively audience, I think we it'd be best to shut this down, keep it as on topic as possible. Um, I'm going to screen share real quick, guys. I want you to, anybody new to the channel, I want you to have a look at our playlist here. Okay, so I've organized them neatly. Um, here's this series so far. So this, this video is going to be entered into this series. Um, all based on Erica's three and a half hour video rebuttal to biblical creation. Uh, definitely, guys, please watch Erica's interview with Joshua Stramidas. I mean, Swamidas, and then watch our video responses. It is not good for him. Um, I was pointing out yesterday if I had a dollar for every time he recycled one of his already debunked arguments, I'd be a millionaire and I'd share it with you guys. I'd share it with you. Uh, so check these out. Chimp Y chromosome took her months to respond, failed miserably. 
Uh, check out our interviews, um, economic geology, oil exploration. Yesterday's was great, genetic diversity. So um, there's that playlist. Must watch interviews. Got a ton of good interviews for you guys. Here's what's funny, guys. They took so long to upload their video, edit their video. It was supposed to be this big deal. It was a major flop. Here's the thing. This Dr. Carter interview that we did, I guess, in the midst of them doing their three and a half hour video, this alone debunks their entire three and a half hour video, especially on the genetics. Um, a biogenesis challenge. They've all failed miserably. Check out this Dr. Ryan Hayes. Dr. Jackson, Dr. Stadler versus Professor Dave, which uh, Dessel gave us that idea, and I appreciate all his help. So, um, yeah. So here, here you go, guys. This is you know I've, I've um, organized it nicely for you guys, and yeah, check this out, guys. It's not looking too good for them. So we've got, like I said, this Wednesday, guys. We've got Dr. Lyle will be here. Critics, bring your best objections, best questions. November 30th, Dr. John McKay, PhD in geology. So it's going to be fun. Check the chat and we're going to shut her down. Um, awesome. Good to see everybody. Leophilus, thanks for being here. We like people of, of differing opinions. We like respectful, cordial discussion. So thanks for being here. You're invited to the Dr. Lyle interview Wednesday. One Punch Man. Lena, good to see you. Okay, guys. As Dessel says, ciao. I say ciao. Renwill says, have a good night. You as well, guys. Definitely watch from the beginning, anybody who just joined us. And... That being said, we'll see you guys Wednesday. Doki Doki with the last minute super sticker. I appreciate it. And hope everybody had fun. God bless. And SFT is out. those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button.